exactly are austere circumstances. Well, the, the Oxford English Dictionary <coughs> describes it as being harsh or severe, simple in style, unadorned, without comforts or luxuries. Now, in the last 10 years, especially the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, there have been quite a number of articles in the literature um, <coughs> where military surgeons from industrialized countries talk about austere, challenging uh, circumstances. Austere for whom? Well, is it the dictionary definition? Or in these military articles, is it really anything less than a level one trauma center? There are American soldiers injured in Afghanistan, in Iraq, who receive better care than if they were injured in the American city. And yet, when they write about it, they tell you these are austere circumstances. You should kind of talk to some of the hospitals in Greece, perhaps. <laughs> Relative, what is austere? Well, yes, armed conflict or war, but basically not if you're uh, the, the army of an industrialized country. In the last issue of military medicine, British medical team, surgical team, working in a hospital called Balad, uh, their experience in Afghanistan. Um, they have a CT scanner. They have blood gases available, ventilators, five general surgeons, five orthopedic surgeons. And they say that these are challenging conditions. The hostess hospital is in Molaus, 25 kilometers away. The general hospital is in Sparta. Sparta doesn't have five general surgeons and five orthopedic surgeons. And the, the public hospital doesn't have a CT scan. What happens if you're in a natural disaster? It's not just Haiti. There was a major earthquake in Athens 15 years ago. We're waiting for the next one. And then we'll see again, I mean, truly austere circumstances. And of course, there's simply a question of poverty. And our colleagues from South Africa have mentioned the difference between the private and the public hospitals in a country like South Africa. There are many countries in the world that are poorer than South Africa. And in that <coughs> question of poverty, it's, there's, a, there's a problem of the unmet surgical burden. People simply do not have access to Care. Well, whether it's a question of money, whether it's a question of geography. Some places there are problems of ethnicity, language, religion, etc., etc. So austere is difficult, but it's relative. And what are some of the challenges we see? Well, if you're a foreign medical team doing humanitarian work or military, it's one thing. If you are the local team, it's something else. There are problems of safety. Infrastructure which can be damaged or simply is not working. Water, sanitation, electricity. Um, there's the problem of logistics, lack of supplies. I'll show you something about that later on. Because if you're going to perform surgery in austere circumstances, it's not just a question of the operating theater or just the emergency work. You have to think about the entire environment in which you are working. Lack of equipment, diagnostic and therapeutic which raises the question of appropriate technology. What is the appropriate level of sophistication of the technology for the circumstances under which you are working? Almost always a lack of blood for transfusion. There are exceptions. It's very context specific and cultural. Some countries people come and get blood, and other places, no. There can be a lack of human resources, and especially in a war, after natural disaster, uh, there's a question of fatigue. If you're you know, operating after a, an earthquake, you're operating 24, 48 hours, you get tired. And there's still patients who operate. The war is the same thing. Uh, there's fear. I mean, if you're being bombed, uh, you're not exactly always in the right frame of mind to, to operate. And this is septic surgery. And there is a big difference between the trauma that you see in a war, natural catastrophe, 
or in the bush, agricultural, etc. Uh, that's a very different type of trauma than from your civilian trauma, uh, which is usually related to uh, road traffic crashes, uh, people falling from <coughs> balconies or mango trees. You always have to plan for alternatives when working in difficult circumstances, and that includes the infrastructure. If my hospital is bombed, and I can no longer work there, where do I go? Or it's a, a, an earthquake. The, the hospital has been destroyed in the earthquake. Where do I go in order to continue operating? What is the alternative? The equipment, communications. How do I bring people into the hospital when the, the earthquake is knocked out, the, the electricity supply, the, Mobile telephones are not working, etc. How do I communicate with people to tell them, come in or don't come in? Uh, the logistics and personnel. People get tired, they get ill. Even doctors and nurses are known to fall sick with malaria, diarrhea, and other things. Ebola. Of all of the deaths in West Africa. <coughs> 9,000 deaths, there are 600 doctors and nurses who die. And the uh, environment can be hostile. Sometimes you have to negotiate with people like this. Uh, this is the solution for park parking. This is one way of solving parking problems. This was my hospital in the Palestinian refugee camp of Shatila in Beirut. It's just beyond the, what about the Swiss with the, the sandbags. That's the one. And with an underground bomb shelter, which is the operating theater. And the reason that there are sandbags there is that on the other side there is a trench. So that you can cross the trench carrying a stretcher without being seen by the snipers. And then sometimes you have to negotiate with these ladies. Bomb Iran before the earthquake and after. There's the pre-hospital phase. We've seen about, about, about helicopter evacuation. Well, in some places in the world, you evacuate your patients differently. This is the Norwegian Red Cross Field Hospital in Banda Aceh after the tsunami. So infrastructure. The hospital, the general hospital in Banda Aceh, was not destroyed but was flooded from the tsunami. Uh, also, one third of the staff were killed. One third were busy looking for their families, and only one third were available to work. So we set up a, a field hospital in the football thing. And it looks clean and simple, rudimentary, but not quite functional. Then you had one of the biggest field hospitals for war center in the world in northern Kenya on the border with South Sudan, which functioned for almost 20 years in Tokyo. You fly in. In the middle of the desert, most of the people live in Tukuls. And there's the hospital. There's not much around. This is called the under the roof because originally the hospital was tents and there was only one building that had a roof. So this became under the roof. Um, we also had an intensive nursing unit. <coughs> there's no mechanical ventilation. Intensive nursing because there are 12 beds and four nurses. In the general ward, you have 40 beds and two nurses. And this is the traction ward, skeletal traction. This is run by the physiotherapist, do an excellent job. And here is your operating theater with three tables. There was another theater with one table. Very often, you had four operations going on at the same time. Um, many amputees, so you have polypropylene. Uh, it's very inexpensive uh, plastic. 
And sometimes, for security reasons, if patients cannot reach the hospital, because the hospital are in government-controlled cities and the young men from rebel areas, even if they're not fighters, are simply afraid to go. And so they're wounded and they don't go. So you take the hospital to the patient. And here is one operating theater. There's another. Sometimes you operate under a tree and the elastic lamp runs off the battery of the car. And then you have ordinary hospitals. This is a hospital in Ethiopia. That's the operating theater. And you boil your instruments. You may have an autoclave that you can put on, in, on, on the stove as well, but it's, it's a pressure cooker. You do use normal saline and dextrose water for various things. Normal saline is salt and water. Dextrose is sugar and water. Each liter weighs a kilogram. Is it really useful to transport tons of sugar and water, salt and water, hundreds of kilometers across the African bush? So there are many hospitals that make their own fluids. Distillator, you add uh, 50 grams of anhydrous dextrose or 9 grams of sodium chloride. You put them into glass bottles which you put into an autoclave, and the moment they come out of the autoclave, you have a rubber stopper, and you recycle the bottles, you can reuse the bottles. When I began my surgery, all intravenous fluids came in glass bottles. It's only afterwards that we had them in plastic bags. And here is an ordinary ward. Now, to work in these circumstances, you have to understand the limits. And some of them are diagnostic. Sorry. You'll be lucky if you have an x-ray machine and it is functional. Ultrasound, yes, but it is very, very user-dependent. You need experience. The learning curve and even teaching programs across the world are very irregular. You know how to use it, good, but there are still many things you need an extra. With an ordinary, even polymobile, Siemens Polymobile 3, uh, you can do angiography, but it's the surgeon that injects the contrast. You can do IVPs and variant studies. Laboratory, you'll have basic hemoglobin, hematocrit, urine, pregnancy test, blood grouping and screening, transfusion, and that's it. Sometimes you may get electrolytes. Sometimes there might be other serology, etc. Uh, thick blood examination for malaria and so forth. But in most general hospitals across the third world, you will not have blood deficits. You will not have lactate or, or, or base deficits. And you can dream about a CT scan. Instead, you use the eye, ear, nose, and ten finger whole body scan. You look at your patient. You listen to your patient. You talk to your patient. You smell your patient. You can diagnose uremia, hepatitis, etc. without the laboratory. And you can, without microbiology, you can diagnose pseudomonas, E. coli, and anaerobic infection. And therefore, you should learn to smell your wounds before debridement, after debridement, when you're ready to close them up, learn to smell your wounds. And then the 10 finger whole body scan. So when I ask my patient, what is your name? Uh, John. Good, they're conscious, the airway is open, and they're obviously breathing. And Well, I don't have to count how many respirations. I know that this patient is dyspneic. And as far as circulation is concerned, well, 90, 80, 60. 
And then, ten fingers. I palpate the patient, beginning with the skull. And I do this because I very often have fragment or bullet wounds in the skull, and with the hair you cannot see the entry. But you will see the blood on the gloves of your fingers afterwards. So, same thing with the axilla, the groins, where there's body hair. So, palpate, chest, abdomen, four limbs, and the vertical column. It takes 15 seconds. That's my primary surgery. Ten finger whole body scan. Now that's especially important during triage of mass casualties. You don't have mass casualties, you can take longer than 15 seconds. But you're basically using your clinical skills and not worried about the imaging. Not the world. Those come as we used to call them the paraclinical study investigation. It came after your initial clinical examination, your complete examination of the patient, and then we did the paraclinical investigation. There's a limit to the therapeutic means you have available. Your anesthesia is going to be local, regional, and ketamine for dead gases. There's no central oxygen, and oxygen in cylinders have to be refilled. So that usually involves distance, you need a factory in order to fill them, you have to be certain that people don't mix up the nitrous oxide with the oxygen because they change the colors. Um, and in a war zone, they're dangerous because an oxygen cylinder is basically a bomb. <laughs> and one bullet, and there's no longer a surgeon, there's no longer a mess of this, there's no patient, and there's no operator. So you use an oxygen concentrator, you need electricity, but local regional ketamine, you can do all kinds of things. And there's a very good thing with ketamine. It is so simple, its safety margin is so good that even a stupid surgeon can use it. And if you get stuck without an anesthetist, which sometimes happens, it's the surgeon who gives the ketamine and an omelet. It's a good analgesic, it's a very good anesthetic. Intramuscular, intravenous bolus, intravenous Fusion, it's better if you do have an anesthetist. And the availability of blood. Is it available? Is it not available? Because very often you will not have a mass transfusion protocol because you have to convince people to give you that blood, and very often your rule is maximum four units per patient, and the few exceptions are not in the acute phase, but afterwards the landmine victim or the burn patient. You may go up to six or eight inches. In some places, it's not a problem. You have as much blood as you want. But depending on the society, people sometimes simply refuse to give blood. Patient monitoring, <coughs> blood pressure pulse, oxygen saturation. It's easy enough now with pulse oximeter. Usually, no central venous lines, because it's the best way to give people septicemia when your hygienic conditions are less than adequate, and as I said, no blood gases, no medical ventilation. Uh, you had a problem with Acinobacter bony. Uh, I think it was it is, or was it you, Rihanna was mentioning, uh, because of the bronchus problem. So imagine if you get it into your mechanical ventilator. But to, to sterilize, to maintain, etc., etc., you need how many technicians? You need what in terms of uh, a workshop, etc. And that is not usually available, except in large centers in big cities, etc. So what we're saying is the appropriate technology, and appropriate for what sort of setting, and for whom. And are we in a conflict, or are we in a natural disaster, or are we simply in a poor country? So simple anesthesia, here's our oxygen concentrator. Uh, there's an, uh, a nice machine which the only reason they use this is for the upper bag. They don't use the, the nitrous oxide and so forth. And there you are, close up cimeter. Uh, you can intubate and you bag the patient. Ketamine, perfusion, foot power versus electricity depends on how big your generator is. No components, whole blood. 
fresh as possible. The American Army rediscovered this in Iraq several years ago. Um, and the water blood bank, of course, is friends, family, and blood. And very often, it's not only fresh, it's warm. It's 37 degrees. You screen the people, you take out the blood, you've done the cross-matching, you know, and you take it immediately into it back to the patient. And of course, auto transfusion, not self -sick. Whether it's a hemothorax, you take it out, you put the bottle around, you give it back, abdomen. In Africa, rural India, for decades, they've, they've had women with ectopic pregnancies. You open the abdomen, it's full of blood. So they are prepared. They have a basin in Oxford sterile, and kidney dishes, and funnel, and so forth, and you scoop up the blood, you filter it, and whatever it still remains liquid, you give it back to the patient. You do the same thing in thorax, you do the same thing for quite a number of things. And you can forget the alternate factor 7A, of course. Now, your clinical skills, and, 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 and Rian was asked what it takes to be a trauma surgeon in South Africa. Well, you do all of that, and you add to it orthopedics, and peripheral trepidation, and debridement of the brain, and that's what it takes to work in Austere circumstances. Plus the cesarean section. Because you're the only surgeon there, perhaps. And there isn't a that it. In effect, it's what a general surgeon did 30 or 40 years ago. And if you take a look at classical British text, Brady and Love, of 30 years ago, that the general surgeon was taught to do a trepidation. To diagnose an extradural hematoma, all right, colonization, you do a trepidation, etc. Basic fracture management, all right. Um, drain the maxillary sinus of the caudal loop, uh, open the chest, open the abdomen. Uh, and, and that is what it takes to work in posterior surgery. You cannot count on having, oh, I've got a neurosurgeon and an orthopedic surgeon and So we talked about x-rays. Clinical basis alone, you will put in a chest tube or a laparotomy. You've got a stethoscope, etc. cetera. Um, there is no place here for an emergency room thoracotomy. Well, usually your emergency room, even in a well-organized hospital under these circumstances, you, you don't want to be opening chests. There are many people, it's not big enough, it's not organized enough, um, and the operating theater is just down the hall. And limited use of ventricular intubation. As I said, there's, there's no mechanical ventilation in these circumstances. And therefore, tracheostomies become very valuable. Right? You, the patient does not have to make the effort to fill the 150 milliliters of dead space of air. Right? Uh, nursing care is easier, and you will use it for quite a number of, of things from head trauma. To, to facial, <coughs> the limits of the surgery that you will be able to perform does not depend on the competence of the surgeon. Number one is your post-operative surgery, the nursing care. That is the biggest limiting factor. Number two is your anesthesia. And you may have an anesthetist, you may have an anesthesia nurse or anesthesia technician in certain countries. That is the standard and the availability of blood for transfusion, not the competency of the surgeon. You can be the best surgeon in the world, you put a wonderful operation, your patient dies post-operative, and when you arrive in the morning, the, the nurse says to you, yes, uh, here's the, the observation. Blood pressure, 90, 90, 80, 85, 70, 60, 0, 0, 0, and the pulse, 0, 0, 0, and it's all written. But the nurse does not have the competency to know what is happening with training, and therefore does not intervene, does not call you. Or 
we get oh, 120 over 90 in a good pulse, etc., and then all of a sudden at 3 in the morning, it's zero. So your post-operative nursing care is your biggest limiting factor. Non-operative management under these circumstances, you can forget. You very often simply do not have the personnel, sufficient personnel, to do repeated examinations. It's, it's very work-intensive non-operative management. Um, and usually a laparoscopy is not available, and therefore, you do a laparoscopy, you open, you open, close, and, and then you go to sleep. Also, damage control surgery under these conditions is difficult because you're not certain if you're going to really have a second look at your patient. Depends on the workload, depends on how many surgeons you have working, and you don't have mechanical ventilation. Now, there are different forms of damage control. In, in Afghanistan in 1993, I was working at an Afghan general hospital in Jalalabad. The Afghan surgeons had still many, this is Mujahideen, now this is before the Taliban. They still had many landmine injuries. And you would have a traumatic amputation on one leg and many injuries to the other leg, from perineum, sometimes even the abdomen, etc. But they would do the, a good surgical amputation on one leg, they would start the bride on the other. Uh, family had not yet arrived, and the patient would exsanguinate on him. <coughs> so what they then did was, okay, we do the amputation on one side, but the other side, we simply scrub. Soap and water. Wet it in, and wrap it up. Stop the operation. Put the patient in bed. It's cold, let's put an extra blanket on him. They didn't understand the hypothermia, they understood that the patient was uncomfortable. Good, but they put an extra blanket. The, the family arrived, he needs blood. Okay, whole blood, fresh, 37 degrees, and you give him three or four units. And the fellow is receiving penicillin and metronidazole, and 48 hours later you take him back to the theater and you deprive the other leg. It's also damage control surgery. Adapted to particular pathology that you have, the particular conditions that you have. And that's important to know. To know your own limits. Now there's a specific sort of pathology here, as I said, it's septic surgery, especially in wars and natural disasters, and therefore you have to use simple techniques huh, that are safe and you can accomplish quickly. Quickly. Because, especially in war and natural catastrophes, you have many patients that are waiting. And so, uh, war and disaster wounds are dirty and contaminated from the moment of injury. Septic surgery, which we know involves a wound debridement or excision, delayed primary closure. You do not suture the wound immediately, you leave it open. No unnecessary dressing changes, you don't play with the wound. There are no signs of infection or hemorrhage. Don't play with it. Let the wound rest. No implants. No osteosynthesis. All right. You use placed or paris, traction, uh, external fixation. This can be useful. And after five days, you take the patient back to the theater. It's clean. The wound is clean. Now you suture it closed, or you do a skin graft. So those are all ruled, they still apply. Plus for Paris, you can even, with a, with a bicycle seat and your mechanic, <coughs> you have them making up an orthopedic table here in Cambodia. This is called a bridge cast, the poor man's external fixation. You have two cylinder casts, proximal and distal, and you have a metal bar uh, joining the two so that you have access to the wound if you need to change the dressing, if you need to do a skin graft, etc. Uh, but you have no pins, etc. sticking in the person's body. Skin action is a very good technique, and external fixation. And for all surgery, we know that the best antibiotic is good surgery, not fourth generation cephalosporin. 
if there is no dead or devitalized tissue left in the wound, it's good circulation. There's no dead space. If it is, you've drained it well, etc. Then the body has its natural defense mechanism. We were talking before about the Krebs cycle. Well, we also have, we know, uh, white blood cells, macrophages, antibod antibodies, etc., etc. We have a defense mechanism as well. The good inflammatory response. And people have been injured since the time of Homer and before. We didn't have antibiotics, and not every wounded person got infected. Now, the multidisciplinary <coughs> surgeon. In Galheo, Somalia, back in 92, there was a trained neurosurgeon. He had to leave Mogadishu, the capital, because he was the wrong clan. So he was back in his clan country. 95% of his patients were injured by landmines. Fine, but he's a, he's a surgeon. He knows anatomy, pathology, he knows how to cut and sew. And therefore, you visit him several times, and you teach him how do you put in a chest tube, how do you do a correct amputation, etc. and he learns it. There are orthopedic surgeons who have to learn how to do cesarean sections, how to go through, you know, the, the abdomen. And a general surgeon, you have to learn basic fracture management and how to put an external fixing. Don't worry about plates and screws, you don't want them. Even if sometimes for some things they're good, they're excellent. The point is, you use one, you have to replace it. And the logistics and the cost of replacing them is horrendous. So the general surgeon has to learn how to do external fixation. And for the tibia, for the humerus, etc., etc., it's easy. That's a secret that orthopedic surgeons do not want people to know. For dressings, well, chronic wounds, honey is good. That's actually excellent. And you will find that in Egyptian papyri that are 4,000 years old, pulped uh, baba papaya and banana leaves for burns, excellent. There's papayin, uh, which helps with the deprivement of any uh, dead skin. Vinegar is excellent, acetic acid, for pseudomonas. And if you want to prepare a site for the skin grafting, you take some normal cell light and you supersaturate it. You keep adding salt until it no longer dissolves. And then you do wet dressings three or four times a day for 10 minutes, and in two or three days, it's wonderful. You, that, that superficial slime is gone, it's nice and red. Go on further than that, a fourth or fifth day, and all of a sudden your granulation tissue turns black. You've burned it. In effect, you're pickling the your granulation tissue, and after two or three days, it's clean. And your skin graft will go off. Training. How do you train to go work in austere circumstances? Well, there's, you begin with something like the, the STC course. You visit other departments in your own hospital. You're a general surgeon, an orthopedic surgeon. Go talk to your colleague, the child gynecologist obstetrician, and say, I want to come in and see you perform the cesarean section. And when you've seen a few, you know, actually, okay, it's not that difficult. The same thing with the orthopedics, etc. <coughs> other training throughout Africa and some places in, in, in Asia, Nepal, India, etc., you will find missionary <laughs> hospitals. But well, there's one or two people doing everything. And it's an excellent place to go, and they'll, they'll feed you. They won't give you a salary, they'll feed you. They'll give you a room to stay, and you, you will learn. And then you can go work with organizations like Médecins Sans Frontières, uh, Doctors Without Borders, Edgar Gori Silva, uh, the International Community Red Cross, the International Federation of Red Cross and the Red Crescent Society. And then you have a few books. For working <laughs> in difficult circumstances, volume one is not trauma, volume two is trauma, and it's no longer in print. But the German uh, Foreign Development Agency, GTZ, has bought the rights from Oxford University Press and they put it online. So you can go to primary surgery. Maurice King, sorry, it's King, not oh, King. Um, and, and a group of about 15, 20 surgeons from East and Central Africa have written this book. And it is adapted to how to do good surgery in a bush hospital. 
and good surgery to cover the entire field of surgery and its subspecialties. But I thank you.